Erev Tov covering Mime Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live, Patreon, November the 26th, 2018. And something came to my mind here just the other day, and I wanted to share that with you, our listeners here, and that is the issue about the ghost cities in China. Why are there dozens of ghost cities in China? According to ABC's report, the Australian edition, and I forget exactly the date on this. We'll take a quick look, though. Uh, they published this back, well, June 26, 2018, actually. And in the, in the documentary that uh, ABC does on this, they speak about, of course, dozens of cities. I think they name about 50 cities that are like this. And I wanted to play a little bit of the clip of this for you. And then I want to share with you some of the insights that I've been looking at myself on why I think this, what, or what these cities are actually going to be used to as we become the cannon fodder, so to speak. Listen into this right here. Apartments stretch into the sky. Traffic lights flash with no traffic in sight. The neon lights are on, but nobody's home. These are China's ghost cities, sprawling, empty spaces, just waiting for one thing, people. All of them were bizarre. All of them were surreal. There's no other way to describe just a city meant for thousands of people that's just completely empty. Now, if you back up after he says it, I want to just show you something here. That appears to be some type of place of worship right here in the background right here. Whether or not that's going to be a synagogue, a church, or something of that effect, don't really know. But you have the apartment buildings, you have the skyscrapers, you have the high-rises, you have very fancy uh, type of uh, buildings as well. Whether they're single home dwellings here, more in a, in a city setting or not, I can't say. But it's like everything from the very affluent uh, to, the, to the middle class or the common laborer, you might say, uh, has been built. And they literally, in the video here, talk about this is designed for millions of people. Let me play a little bit more of this. That's just completely empty. The few people that live here often wonder if they'll ever get neighbors. Samuel Stevenson Yang is a photographer working to document this modern Chinese phenomenon. I think the mission started because it was just hard for people to believe exactly how much empty property was all over the country and we you know we had to just go in person to take photos so that we could show people just the sheer scale of the building that was going on as china's mass construction phase continues bigger and more elaborate but empty cities are popping up still still ongoing just how many properties lay empty across china but some guess it could be as high as 64 million. That was it. 64 million empty properties across China. I mean, it's just phenomena. And the guy that's going to speak here next talks about Manhattan in comparison. Listen to what he I says. Think able to like walk through this, you know, Manhattan-sized, you know, new city, you know, before it was, you know, completely built. So you see the the, the thickets of, you know, skyscrapers. I mean, we're talking like really, really, you know, super tall skyscrapers. You know, everywhere. And I was just able to kind of just walk through this area, and it was like, I mean, it's something that's kind of like, you know, kind of like, kind of like a nightmare, or like you know, kind of dystopian movie of the future. And you just wake up, and all the people are gone, and it's just you and these like empty, you know, you know, husky you know, buildings everywhere. Well, they're not going to stay empty. And that's what I believe myself. And I believe that by the grace of God, I've actually stumbled on to what is the real deal about this. I did a little research because the Lord laid it on my heart that these cities that are being prepared right now are actually prepared for the elite of the United States, maybe even possibly Canada and other parts of the world. Perhaps some of the elite of Europe. The politicians, the wealthy bankers and business owners, etc., and their families and their extended families, and of course the network of workers that are the ones that uh, create this new world order scheme that is going to be going on in the very near future. Because after all, the United States and other parts of the world are going to be in oblivion in the not so distant future from a major war. And of course, nationalism is to be destroyed in the United States. Well, those that they're planning on saving have to have somewhere to go. And oddly enough, I had one friend, or an acquaintance, I should say, that I've spoken to you guys about before on Israeli News Live, our YouTube channel, that had often told me about the elite would actually go 
to the Far East. He spoke about the Philippines. He spoke about China to me. And of course, I remembered how that President Trump's own grandchildren are studying the Mandarin language. Well, it gets more interesting than that. I actually began to piece things together as I looked at this, thinking to myself, wow, you mean that when they go to blow this nation up here with a war with Russia, some kind of provocation that is done in order to cause Russia to strike the United States? Not to say that Putin is not well aware of this himself. Maybe he is, maybe he is not. Maybe he's only playing a part in this, or maybe he's just totally unaware and will attack the United States eventually anyway. Nonetheless, what's going to happen is they're going to move mass amounts of people to the Far East, to China. Maybe they'll fly them in through Europe. Maybe they'll come from the other direction as well. Maybe that's part of the Silk Road initiative to be able to fly them in, say, to Europe and then to take them by high-speed rail all the way into China, to these so-called ghost cities. In fact, I was shared with some uh, very interesting uh, friend of mine uh, that has connections in the intelligence community, not necessarily intelligence himself, uh, but has shared with me how that when the United States will be struck by war in the not so distant future, you can count on one thing, the elite and their families and all the support staff will be well protected underground. We know about that huge airport over there in, uh, uh, what is that? That's in Colorado Springs, right? Huge underground network there for the airport where people could be shuttled into there and then shuttled out of the country to safety. It looks like China is definitely going to be a major destination. And by the way, I think it's going to really surprise you when you find out some other things I'm going to share with you on this. You know, you have to go, as I said, though, to the Silk Road, that Silk Road initiative, which, by the way, they made it look like Xi Jinping was really the guy that inspired all of this. But in reality, Xi Jinping is not the inspiration for this huge, uh, massive uh, operation called the Silk Road or the rest, or, you know, the, the rebuilding of this. It says here the Silk Road was established during the Han Dynasty beginning around 130 BC. Marketers and trade posts were strung along a loose uh, scheme of thoroughfares that ran from Greco Roman metropolis of Antioch across the Syrian desert through modern day Iraq and Iran to the former Chinese capital of. Uh, Shiwan and streamlining the transport of the livestock and grain, medicine, and, and science. In 2013, Xi Jinping, which is the current president of China, announced that the Silk Road would be reborn as the Belt and Road Initiative, the most uh, ambitious infrastructure project the world has ever known. Well, oddly enough, the money for that project has come heavily from Jewish backers or supposed Jewish backers, the Rothschilds, the families, these multi, what, billion, trillionaire type people that have been funding this. And the idea did not uh, start with Xi Jinping. It was actually a Hungarian man back in the mid 1800s, if I remember that right, I studied this once before, that actually uh, initially brought the idea forward. Now, from what I can see, though, is that they've been setting up to continue the industrial revolution that America once had and to continue this massive growth of wealth and income. But the thing is, is they know they have outlived that ability to do it in the United States. Well, after all, we had the trade unions, all that to try to bring better wages and better jobs for the poorer class. And that just doesn't work. Well, I think it works great. But unfortunately, uh, those wealthy business owners don't think it works. They don't like paying all that money out. They like communism better. In fact, recently, that's why one friend of mine, and I know he meant well when he said it, uh, as he spoke to me about China's involvement in Haifa and building the gas pipelines from Haifa going over to Greece and also to Northern Africa, the split right there, and how that it is going to be the West and the Israel that will be the big winners in this. Well, in reality, the West is not going to be the big winner. But the wealthy business, businessmen of the United States, they will be the big winners because they're the ones that have been investing in this pipeline. They are the ones that have been uh, making sure that the wars have been spearheaded to overthrow Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Sudan, as General Wesley Clark did say himself. Well, interesting, isn't it? 
gets more interesting though. I want to share with you some of those thoughts that I had on this. I thought about the death of America, as it's put here in the trumpet, called the death of American manufacturing, globalization, and outsourcing, outsourcing are hammering our icons of industry. For over a half a century, American manufacturing has dominated the globe. It turned the tide in World War II and hastened the defeat of Nazi Germany. It subsequently helped rebuild Europe and Japan. It enabled the United States to outlast the Soviet Empire in the Cold War. And at the same time, it met all the material needs of the American people. That's very true. But now, well, we just got too much debt, I guess. During this period, many American icons are born. Companies like, notice the name, General Motors, Ford, Boeing, Maytag, Levi Strauss become household names. American manufacturing became synonymous with the quality of ingenuity. And on the back of this industrial output rose American middle class, high paying manufacturing jobs in turn helped spur a robust and growing economy that depended little on foreign nations for manufactured goods and armaments. Well, about the only thing keeping the United States going today, of course, is the military industrial complex. And that's the only people that we're really kind of uh, employing now. Yes, as Trump says, we can't turn our back on Saudi Arabia. They're one of our biggest customers. What you don't realize is that Saudi Arabia is the biggest customer because what they need is they are creating a more massive military over with Saudi Arabia to help police the entire world. Hmm, makes you wonder then. There's going to be a lot of beheading in the world because the Saudis will have a big police stake in the future military of the world. Not to mention, really and truly, all we're doing is we're making America great again on the blood of children and little babies and mothers and fathers that are trying to live a little peaceful life on some backside of a desert somewhere in the middle of nowhere where the life and luxuries that we have is nothing for them. And what little bit they do have is being crushed. As a new world order is taking over everything that they have. But I think it was interesting because as the article here in the Trumpet goes on to show you is how that we went from having a great robust economy here to suddenly those manufacturing jobs begin to go overseas. And they did during the Reagan years. And more and more big business owners moved over and moved over and moved over. Well, I had friends of mine that were actually uh, big owners in some of these types of companies, and yes, they are Jewish friends, and yes, a lot of Jewish people own big companies, and but not just Jews either. There are some other wealthy businessmen out there that also moved their manufacturing companies overseas as well. But there was one thing that was interesting. I never will forget because I am an inventor. That is something I do. I've created many very interesting uh, products in my lifetime. One of those, though, was very detailed. It was made for moving very sensitive equipment. It was highly sophisticated. But to manufacture it in the United States, the very base cost was about $2,000 to manufacture this uh, smart design that I made that could move sensitive machines. Well, oddly enough, the very friend of mine that was interested, that owned a, and I won't call his name, but owned a very massive uh, company here in the United States, had the manufacturing portion of his company over in China. And he said to me, he said, Steve, he says, we can market this item. It will be a very big ticket item. But the thing is, is the cost of manufacturing such a technical device, although America could make it much better, we need to save money and send it over to China. Well, I refused. I said, why do we need to send it to China when we need jobs in America? And I said, at the very least, I would send it to Israel so that our people in Israel also can benefit from the production of this particular device. Then they turned me down as a result. I've had several things that I've invented. All of them would have been very successful, but I always wanted it either built in America or built in Israel. In every case, I was turned down because they wanted these things all manufactured in China. Now, getting to my point here, I begin to realize the moving of American manufacturing over to China was done intentionally. That's what funded these cities. By sending all of the businesses over there, all the manufacturing jobs over to China, and the fact that now China was making it for pennies on the dollar compared to what we did in these poor Chinese sweatshops, where these poor 
Chinese people under communist regime who cannot kick back, cannot complain, will not have unions, will not make multi-millions, and will not live in big fancy houses. The profits, though, were being used to make those cities, to make these ghost cities, and what for? Because they know that the ultimate plan is to bring down the United States and they wanted a place for their children, the elite at that time, in the future, the government, all that that would be lost in America to be able to move to the new headquarters of a new world order. Now, I'm not saying that China would be the new headquarters, quote unquote, per se, but China will be the leading industrial nation at that time. And by moving all of the industry over to China, and by having everything so much cheaper, but yet, we still pay the same price for the car. We still make some cars here, but we still pay a high, not only that, we pay a higher price for the car than we did back in the 80s. Everything is more expensive. It didn't matter that the manufacturers have moved to China. We pay any much more money anyway. But what were they doing? They were taking the profits that they were making, massive amounts of profits, and they were investing it, building all these future cities here for the people that they're going to save during the depopulation agenda that's going to happen in the United States, possibly Canada as well. My friends, you there, and maybe even in Europe, maybe they're going to take you guys out as well. Maybe it's going to be a free-for-all for Russia, Western in Europe, they have to think about why they're moving all the refugees into Europe and why they're moving all the refugees now into the United States. You know, I was told, and this is sad to say, but I was told that not only are they going to destroy this nation, but they plan on genociding. A racial genocide, no less. You don't think that some of these elite care about the color of your skin? They do. Sadly enough, they do. And I think that's a shame, but I want to share more. It doesn't end there. Let me show you some interesting things. Teach your kids Mandarin the Jared and Ivanka way for $75,000 and up a year. As I said to you, if you remembered, President Trump's grandchildren are learning Mandarin. And in fact, when we went to go see about enrolling our son into high school, we were surprised to find out that Chinese is now the, one of the main languages to be learned in high school four-year course. You're kidding me. It used to be French or Spanish. Now listen, I'm not against the idea of learning Chinese. Great thing. Yes, there is a lot of business between the United States and China, but when you realize there's an agenda behind it, then you understand why they're doing what they're doing. All right? But it doesn't end there. Of course, China, uh, President Trump, uh, Ivanka Trump's five-year-old daughter, Arbella Kushner, serenaded visiting Chinese President Xi Jinping with a Mandarin folk song earlier this month. It prompted an outpouring of affection from many in China. In America, it probably prompted at least a little envy among other parents of young Mandarin learners. President Donald Trump may be known for his treats to knock China down and peg or two, but his grandchildren are part of a growing desire among American families to help their kids take advantage of China global rise with Mandarin skills. It is a global elitist plan. What President Trump is doing is only a charade. And unfortunately, many of us are just gullible enough to believe the charade. But, like I said, it gets more interesting. I ran across this book here, Chapter 9 is called Israel and the Jewish People in Chinese Cyberspace in 2002. And you want to keep the date in, in close in mind as I speak about this. It's uh, Zhang Ping background. In the year 2000, a dramatic change occurred in Chinese cyberspace concerning the Chinese understanding of Israel and the Jewish people. Described by some people as a language revolution, the change involved a re-examination of history of the Jewish people, especially that of the State of Israel. Discussion about the true situation of Palestinians and terrorism and the relationship between the Chinese people and the Jewish people empowered by a relative freedom of expression and information access on the internet. A large number of Chinese web surfers challenged the anti-Zionist tradition in communist China and rephrased their expression regarding Zionism. 
the state of Israel, the Jewish people, etc. While tradition pro-Palestinian voices are still in the mainstream and Chinese official media pro-Israeli activists and Chinese, the cyberspace in 2002 radically changed the whole picture and made pro-Israeli expression a common fact in the Chinese virtual world. All right, now, this really began to blow me away. There was an intentional move, and believe me, there is hardly no freedom of expression when it comes to China. In fact, I just got a report from a friend of mine, and I cannot call his name for his own safety. He does live in China, and he let me know that, yes, there is still the persecution of the Christians of China. It is a communist government, and although some can worship, but they have to, Yeshua, they still have to be very cautious in how they go about it. Because it's not accepted, well, unless you're in one of the norms like the Catholic Church, but even that is kept under a strict, tight leash. But Israel, Israel began to grow a very close relationship, whereas the Chinese government at one time was actually siding with the Palestinians and what they were going through. Now the change began, a transformation in 2002, and downplaying the issue of what's happening to the Palestinians and instead encouraging a stronger relationship between Israel and the Chinese people or the Chinese government in this case here. And it would pay off and understandably so because after all you have to understand in New York a lot of the major companies that are in New York are Jewish owned. And I don't fault the Jewish people for owning them. Anybody that can be successful I Hey, that's what the American dream is all about. But the point being is, is that when there comes this mass migration of people to China in the very near future, a lot of them will be Jewish. A lot of them will not be Jewish. But say, just for example, in New York alone, when the guy talks about Manhattan, there will be millions of Jews that will come there, that will inhabit those cities right there in China to continue this mega movement of an economic powerhouse. As I said earlier, and I didn't bring the proof with me on this particular broadcast, but the Rothschilds had invested the money in China for the Silk Road. It wasn't so much Chinese money that did this. And again, that money came from the billions and billions of profits that were made by moving all the manufacturing jobs over to China to begin with back in the 80s and 90s. So what do you know? So they've been working on also changing the relationship between the Chinese people and that of the Israeli people. And as I was asked as well by a friend of mine, and I appreciate this because I do love Chinese people very dearly. I do not like a communist government though that suppresses freedom of religion. But yes, the Chinese are there in Israel, in Haifa, and as I have been told, they even buy uh, parts and material from the Arabic community. They're including them in there. That is probably more so China's part than it is uh, Israel's part because that's not too favorable of a situation to do, especially as much suppression as we see going on in the nation. But then again, it's tit for tat. We see also radical Palestinians that also strike at Israel. But then again, they're provoked. People have no idea what's really going on over there. But the truth of the matter is, the Silk Road is coming right to the port of Haifa. And at that port, it is going to branch off, again, another branch in the Silk Road, which one will go to Greece, the other will go to Northern Africa. Maybe this is why Greece had to be toppled economically. Nobody ever considered that as a possibility. Libya, yeah, we knew it was coming. So the pipeline goes to Libya, the other pipeline goes to Greece, what do you know? Now the full control is already there. And the cities, those mega cities, those ghost, ghost cities as they're called, that were built in China, are for the economic powerhouse that made America great at one time, that will once, will soon, in the very not so distant future, make China great. And after all, they're ghost cities because, well, they'll kind of be on their own. Very interesting. Well, I guess you could say it's a theory, but after all, I think it's a theory that has a lot of weight. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live here on Patreon. And uh, listen, if you happen to be one of our, our friends that are following here, 
Hey, you don't know anything about the conference that we're going to be speaking at this Saturday and Sunday in Kansas City, Kansas, actually a place called Shawnee, Kansas, go to our website. <coughs> Click on more information at the top. It'll take you right to the website there, where the conference is, how you can register. And by the way, if you are, are not able to register online, we got four days, 12 hours until the conference, but you're, if you're not able to register online, you can actually buy tickets at the door. Uh, we are going to be making it available for those that want to attend, but they couldn't get them online. So, hey, come. There will be someone that will take tickets at the door. This is very uh, tight security at this conference, so be aware of that. Everyone must be registered in order to be a part of this conference. Uh, you can also, if you look at our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org, about to lose my voice here because this little sinus issue, uh, go to Kansas Conference under Recent Articles, click on that. It has our itinerary on there, the speakers, when they're speaking, a clip giving you a little insight from Tennessee. And by the way, I've had people ask me, are you going to speak about things that were not spoken about in Tennessee or Orlando? Yes, absolutely we will. Uh, I'm going much deeper than what I did in any of these conferences there. Uh, this is going to be one that I'm going to record. I cannot say when it will be released. Uh, some segments will be broadcast live. Uh, I will be doing a little teaching on biblical uh, insights uh, that I'll probably run live on uh, the morning of uh, Shabbat. And uh, also, I may be running live my wife's broadcast on 5G. Uh, and I'll talk to Dr. Steve Pigeon, and if he's up for it, and that is if we have the internet capabilities, please keep that in mind, we may run that live as well. The other things that are very sensitive uh, when it comes to my time with the intelligence community, I am going deeper. I'm going to be getting into some other issues that have happened in this nation uh, that people are not really aware of the truth about. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live here on Patreon. Thank you for supporting this. Thank you guys for sticking it out here with me and not just bailing out. Uh, I've been doing some uh, movement here and there, I've been traveling a little bit. I don't always say why, but there's always a purpose behind it. And eventually you find out the blessing of it. You may never know why. I may never say why I did it, but you will get the blessing of it here. So thank you for supporting us here on Patreon. And if God ever lays more for you to, to, on your heart to help, you can always visit our website as well and donate there if God lays that upon your heart. God bless you and thank you. Sure.